but it's not all about genes. So if you take all the genetic associations that we've identified, there is clearly evidence that there are other non-gene factors that increase or decrease the risk of disease. And these are the bacteria that we encounter, but also the diet. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the bacteria within us. So to just get some numbers out there, microbes outnumber the human cells in our body 10 to 1. There are, these microbes have in total about 8 million genes within them. So we have about 20,000 genes. The bacteria have about 8 million unique genes. So extremely complex genetic makeup. There are about 10,000 species of bacteria within us that live within us and contribute mostly to health. And they contribute to about 2.5 to 6 pounds of our total body weight. So a large contribution to body mass. And they generally do good things. So they break down complex carbohydrates to give you um, nutrition. They are clearly important to synthesize vitamins. And they also prevent pathogens such as salmonella and listeria and certain other bacteria from getting into your body system and settling there to cause disease. So up until about two years ago, we didn't know what the normal microbiome or the normal bacteria in the gut. And again, a study that was done led by the Broad Institute looked at 300 healthy individuals and sampled their, microbacteria, their bacteria from multiple body sites. So about 15 body sites in males and about 18 body sites in females. And asked the question, who's there? What do they make? What do they do? And what was surprising, again summarizing a lot of work, the bacteria in the gut or the gastrointestinal system is very different from the bacteria on your oral cavity or in your skin. So clearly these bacteria are site dependent and basically have a function in those specific sites. The second important finding was that if you look at the bacteria, for example, in the, or, uh, in the gut, you can see that if you took 123 individuals, each one of those individuals have a unique bacterial signature. So just like your genetic trait, you can define and identify traits of bacteria that's unique to each individual. So it makes this now an extremely complex system. So genes that contribute to disease, several millions of bacteria with many genes within them that contribute in potentially can contribute to disease, but generally do good. But nature has been favorable as well. If you take the bacteria from the different body sites, so if you look at the gut or the tongue or the oral cavity, the products that these bacteria make that's measured here are exactly the same. So different sets of bacteria in the gut contribute to a certain product system. And similarly, in the oral cavity, it's the same product system that's made. So there are some rules to how bacteria live in our body and the good, good products they make and prevent disease from coming in. A third concept that I want to highlight is the diet. So we've moved from eating food from the floor to now living on food that comes in a box. Um, we've clearly altered also our microbiome by the number of pills and medic medicines that we take. And clearly there is now evidence that varying levels of stress also alter this bacteria. We've also more recently identified that the genetic makeup of each individual also alters the bacteria. So I started off by saying these large number of bacteria do good things. I'll give you a few examples. So the complex carbohydrates that we take are normally not usable by the human body if you don't have bacteria in the gut. The gut bacteria break, break down these complex carbohydrates and make something called short-chain fatty acids plus many other products that you know, gives you good barrier function. So it protects the gut from leakiness and also educates the immune system. What about the fish oil tablets that we take? So they produce three fatty acids or omega fatty acids that engage a specific receptor, so a signaling program on the cell, and again educates the immune cells. Let's get more exciting here. Excite. What about sushi eaters? So if you live in Japan, 
you tend to tolerate sushi and you are able to handle loads of sushi. Whereas if you were living in Boston and you went to a sushi restaurant, after your second plate of sushi, you often end up with diarrhea. And that's because the Japanese have acquired a gene that's been transferred from a marine bacteria that allows you to digest the wrappings around sushi. So you are better able to tolerate the increased load, whereas in the American diet, a huge load of sushi usually results in symptoms. Another example is, this was an elegant study that was done in Burkina Faso and in Europe, where they looked at the intake of wheat products, uh, protein, sugar, fat, and fiber. And what was striking was that the intake of wheat diet clearly altered the good bacteria in the body. So in those who lived in Burkina Faso had a certain type of bacteria that was very different if you lived in the European Union. This also had some good effects. So if you look at the susceptibility to infections, if you look at the children who lived in Burkina Faso, they had a significant decrease in the number of bacterial infections. So they had less salmonella, less shigella, less lung infections, and less diarrhea. So clearly, good bacteria are good for us. Diet clearly plays a significant role in altering the good bacteria and thereby increasing or decreasing your susceptibility to the, some of the diseases that I told you. So with this background, let's get back to celiac disease. So I told you celiac disease is a disease that abnormally responds to gluten. There is a genetic risk. So if you have a first degree relative with celiac disease, your risk of developing the disease is one in 22. Second degree relatives is about one in 40. So clearly there is a huge at-risk population around that index patient. And I told you about new ways of identifying genes that are associated with risk of celiac disease. Now we've identified 40 different genes that increase the risk of celiac disease. So in the future, one is going to be able to understand how these genes contribute to increase how they contribute to the recognition of the gluten product that I told you, and then cause damage to the gut. So how does celiac disease present? It usually often presents at the time of weaning. Symptoms tend to improve during adolescence, but generally can present at any time in life. So I've seen patients who have presented for the first time with celiac disease at the age of 50. I've seen patients uh, who've presented with significant osteoporosis, so the weakness in their bones, because of undiagnosed celiac disease at the age of 60. So it can present very, at various times in your life. And as I told you, if you remember that iceberg diagram that I showed you, it's only a small percentage of patients who have symptoms in the GI tract and present early. What about the presentation? So they can basically, in children, you can have a large number of presenting symptoms that clearly can differ in adults and can be general symptoms of lack of energy to more significant symptoms such as significant weight loss um, and changes in your gut function. You have a diagnosis of celiac disease. Can I continue to cheat? Can I eat occasional food that contain gluten? The answer is no, because if you now increase the exposure to gluten, you not only increase the risk, make celiac disease worse, but you also increase the incidence of other autoimmune diseases. And so the types of diseases that have been associated with celiac disease are diabetes, skin conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, dysfunction of the thyroid gland. So a large number of autoimmune disease. And what happens here is that I told you the product in wheat Gluten is the trigger, so normally you have a gut that has a lining of epithelium that's well-organized, cells that make in contact with each other, don't allow things to get in except for the food that you want absorbed, don't allow bacteria to get in, don't allow bacterial products to be recognized by the immune system. But when you have an allergy to gluten, then you activate a set of T cells, that interact with B cells to make antibodies. 
that then come and now destroy the structure of the epithelium. So that's one of the early signs of celiac disease. Now, I just told you that if you don't control your diet and you continue to eat gluten, your incidence of other autoimmune diseases go up. And that's because these T cells that are now specific for gluten decide to be specific for other parts of the body. So they attack joints and you get rheumatoid arthritis. They attack the thyroid gland and you get thyroid disease. So it basically loses its specificity but continues to cause damage. What's also been interesting is I just told you that two years ago we identified many genes that increase or decrease the risk of celiac disease. And one of the take home findings has been that several of those genes in fact contribute to the cell response that's seen to gluten. So several of these genes are genes that are increased, associated with increased risk. They are the ones that get activated when you see gluten and cause damage to the cell. So how do we treat celiac disease? The best treatment is obviously to be on a gluten-free diet, but it's challenging. So what we've started to do more recently is to sort of begin to take the genes that are associated with risk of celiac disease, look at the diet and the infections that precipitate this, and try to see whether we can reprogram these genes so that you can alter the risk of uh, celiac disease symptoms and complications so that you can begin to tolerate some of the celiac, I mean, some of the gluten-containing diet. So this is mostly what's happening in the United States. Another interesting study that we've just um, started, um, com I mean, a completing analysis, was we looked at 1,000 children who were born in Finland, 600 children who were born in Estonia, and 400 children who were born in East Karelia. These children, we looked at their gut microbiome every month from birth to six years. And now we have ways of predicting, so there is clearly a marked increase in the risk of type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, thyroid disease, and allergy if you were born in Finland. None of the kids in Karelia have this similar clinical presentation, and Estonia is somewhere in between. So we have now ways of beginning to identify what are the microbiome changes, what are the immune changes that precede the onset of type 1 diabetes, what happens to the microbiome after you have established disease with the hope of finding ways of shifting the microbial balance back to the healthy state. Another interesting project to think about is that what about the microbiome in the broader community. So with Rob Knight and others collaborating on an American gut project, and the goal here is to then identify what happens to the microbiome depending on whether you're on Weight Watchers, you continue on a DASH diet, gluten-free, and so forth. So the hope is that in addition to understanding the genetic makeup of this disease, trying to identify how genes contribute to disease, we can also begin to identify ways of correcting the microbiome so that your risk of this disease is less and you can begin to tolerate the types of food you would like to include. I think I'll stop there and maybe Wayne, you want to present and then we'll take questions. Or